You know, I think it would be a neat study to just go through the entire Bible. Like, I'm not going to take you through every verse, but for me personally to go through the Bible, every time music is mentioned, singing is mentioned, all those, and just kind of pull all that out and, uh, and just kind of lump it into some categories where we can learn uh, some valuable lessons on that. And so here's what we're doing tonight. All right. I've, I've, uh, I'm starting this. Let's read through the introduction. I like preaching this way teaching this way, whatever you want to say, and I know why, because my brain, I just sometimes get kind of overwhelmed with thoughts, and they don't always come out right. Preaching this way, I have an opportunity to stop and give you your blank, and then I can rest and give my, <laughs> my thoughts, so it's kind of cheating, but this is good. Okay, so I'm going to give you uh, this first introduction. You fill in the blanks here. The purpose of this study is to take an in-depth look at the instances where the topic of music comes up in the Bible. And in case you didn't know, there's a lot. <laughs> I mean, the whole book of Psalms is, a, is, is about singing, right? It's songs unto the Lord, and, and, uh, and it's, we'll, we'll cover a lot of that, no doubt. Whether it's secular music, secular is your first blank there, whether it's secular music with no religious significance, right? There's a lot of music, that we hear on a day-to-day -day basis, right, and, and uh, we grew up with. We learned our ABCs to music. That was secular, right? Well, we see some secular music in the Bible as well, whether it's uh, no religious significance, music that's directed towards a false god. We see that a lot in the Bible. Or, or false religious ideology is your next blank, ideology. And what do I mean by ideology? Well, basically just kind of a school of thought. You know, a philosophy, some, uh, 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 the wrong philosophy, which is pretty much all music out there other than good godly music, just teaching false philosophy, false religious ideology. We'll talk about that from the Bible. Or music that praises the God of the Bible. We want to find out what the Bible says about music. Or, in our King James Bible, music with a K on the end. M-U-S-I-C-K, that's how it's spelled in the Bible. If you're looking that up uh, in a Bible program or whatever, that's how it's spelled, music in the Bible. Here are some of the categories in which we can divide all the many uses of the music in the Bible. Probably not exhausted, exhaustive, but this is what we're going to cover. Uh, today we'll only cover the first one. That's music as a festive celebration. Okay, music as a festive celebration. Number two will be music as a mood enhancer. Actually, looking for, really looking forward to preaching that one tomorrow. Like a lot of my studying this week for this message, it was like, I want to jump into that, but I'm going to have to hold off on that until next week. But a mood enhancer, music affects the mood. Music makes, makes you behave in a certain way because it uh, enhances your mood. I'm not going to preach on that yet. Okay, music as a teaching tool, number three. Music as a teaching tool. Yes, we see that in the Bible, where they use music, songs, to uh, learn things. And then finally, uh, I've got music as church, as a church ministry, right? We in in the church as a church body, we use music to minister to each other. And there's a lot of other examples that we'll look at whenever that time comes. Okay, but first of all, let's look in the Bible at music as a festive celebration. All right, this is. Used to commemorate a person or place or event, and, and it either commemorates them negatively or positively, right? And so this is the way that the music is often used to, as a celebration to commemorate somebody, okay? A, we can see clearly throughout history and in our society today that music and celebration goes together. Hey, let's celebrate. The world says it's going to be music probably drinking and dancing and all that associated with it, but there's going to be music for celebration. I can go to any part of the world. I'm probably getting ahead of myself. Every festival and celebration in any culture seems to have live music. I lived in Japan for about seven years of my life. Two different times we went over there. My dad was in the military. And often there would be, uh, they, they have a lot of festivals in Japan. And oftentimes, like the Sakura Festival is uh, cherry blossoms. And they would go... And they would parade in the streets, and there'd be live music and people dancing and singing, playing on instruments and all that. You can go to pretty much any culture and find that to be the case. Go to Africa, definitely the case. They'd celebrate everything through music, 
right? And so uh, we can see that. Look, how about this one? Number one here. There's a song that we sing uh, in honor of somebody for he's a jolly good fella. For he's a jolly good fella that nobody can deny, right? <laughs> That's what we do. We just, we're using it to celebrate somebody and we're using music. Every festival and celebration, any culture, I already read that, seems to have live music or amplified recorded music. You know, uh, every time I try to go to an athletic event, go to a race or something like that, you got to walk past the speakers that are blaring music. Oftentimes, get this, man, went to Walmart today in Iola, and I'm listening, I'm, I'm getting my tires, uh, I got new tires on the van, and I'm listening to the speaker, and I'm like, it's hard to tell, like, I don't know, I think that might be Christian music. <laughs> and I'm listening to the words, I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's contemporary Christian music. You know, that's, they have used that now, Christian contemporary music. It used to be like, you know, the world wasn't really attracted to Christian music. And, uh, and I remember growing up even, a, a, a fairly new Christian, you know, still learning, still growing. And I remember a group came out, DC Talk, right? Now, I didn't know this, but apparently Toby Mac, that's a name that you might hear thrown out. He was from that group originally. I didn't know that until I started studying. I'm telling you, man, I've had enough Toby Mac and Hillsong and Lauren Daigle and all that. to I mean, just studying for this, I've had enough just to last me a lifetime. <laughs> okay? But Toby Mac uh, made this song. It's called... Uh, Showtime or something about Showtime. I can't remember what it is. The NFL bought that and they used that in the background for their little clips, like highlights for the for the NFL or whatever. And it's just in the back. And you know what? I would never guess. I would think that's just rock and roll, right? So anyway, that's that's supposedly. And so here's what happened. The 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 church, so called, got so good at imitating the world's music that now they're taking a watered down Christian music, which isn't really Christian at all, usually. You read the lyrics and you're like, okay, it might have said God in there or something, but it really didn't uh, amount to much. And then they put that back into the world. The world's embracing it. You go all over and they're, and they're playing this music. And they're like, hey, that sounds pretty good. I, from what I understand, Lauren Daigle is like one of the, like top on the charts. And I'm not, I'm talking about secular music, top on the charts. And uh, anyway, uh, why, how did I get off on that? But, but they use the, anywhere you go, they're celebrating with music, right? And you can't even tell anymore if it's uh, contemporary Christian music or if it's the world music, but it's everywhere you go celebrating. Oftentimes, like I said, drinking is associated with it. Dancing, feasting, you know, all this is, is kind of goes together. And we see that, we see all this in the Bible. We'll get to that. So some biblical examples of this will be discussed in the lesson, Music as a Mood Enhancer next week, Lord willing. All right, B. We see in the scripture where people, places, or events are celebrated with music, okay? Brother Justin just read from Exodus 15. Let's turn there. And this is an example of, in the Bible, where we see a lot of music used to proclaim what God has done. It's proclaiming what God has done. I'm not going to read it all over again. But they just, the, the, they just got delivered from the Egyptian army. The, uh, they saw, I mean, that's quite a miraculous thing to go through the Red Sea on dry land and have walls on, uh, of water on both sides and to go through all that and then to watch God destroy the Egyptian army through all that. And they come out of that and they instantly go into this great song. In, in Exodus uh, 15, he says, my page, I don't have my regular Bible, so these pages are sticking together. And it says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. All right, and so they're singing this music. It's edifying other people, but ultimately it's for the Lord. That's important. Okay, that's who's being celebrated is the Lord. It's not celebrating like, well, can you believe we just had so much faith? I mean, God looked down on us, and did you see how he blessed us and allowed us to go through? That's really not the emphasis. The emphasis is, look how, God, how good God is, and look what he accomplished. Okay? And then at the very end of that chapter, you see in verse 20, And Miriam and the prophetesses, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, 
And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances, and Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his riders hath he thrown in the sea. They're commemorating this event with this festive celebration. And they're saying, look how good God is. Did you see how mighty he is? Did you see what he accomplished? And this is uh, uh, the way that he was celebrated. Now, this is what we try to accomplish typically when we sing from the songbook. Now, don't get me wrong. We could go through the songbook and pick out some places that, hey, that's all about self. Like, that's just, this song really isn't glorifying God, all right? And we can find some songs in here that, are, that have maybe some shady doctrine even, okay? So don't get me wrong on saying, like, it's not like this is inspired word of God, okay? But, man, he was, read, he was singing, uh, leading us in that song, I Know Whom I've Believed. And I looked at this third verse. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in Him. I mean, is that not good doctrine? I mean, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. When you hear the Word of God preached, the Spirit begins to prick the heart. And it says, I don't understand how He does it, but that happens and it creates faith in a man. And I don't know how that happens, he says, but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. I'll take that over Hillsong and, and, uh, <laughs> and all those other uh, casting crowns or whatever garbage is out there. I'll take that over that any day. Good stuff, good stuff. Uh, the Bible, uh, we read, here's a song that I just wrote down a couple songs. Obviously, we can go through a whole bunch. Look at a uh, song in our songbook, verse ni uh, song 19. <clears throat> I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, reading all of these, but... Song number 19, to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. O come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. I mean, that's some good singing, <laughs> right? And that's even a pretty simple, I mean, that's not like some major deep doctrine, but that's just good celebrating the Lord. Glory to God. Give God uh, to God be the glory. Ch uh, song 30. I like this one. It says, All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate, prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. That's just good stuff, man. <laughs> That's good stuff. Look at verse, uh, Song 45. Song 45. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, Dwelt among men, my example is he. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. One day they left him alone in the garden. One day he rested from suffering free. Angels came down o'er his tomb to keep vigil. Hope of the hopeless, my Savior is he. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered, now is ascended my Lord evermore. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming, one day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one's bringing, glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. You see how the songs are celebrating God and, and his son and the salvation through what Jesus did on the cross. And it's just, I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's good, good singing. I'm not for, I mean, I'm not against, excuse me, uh, new songs. Sing a new song unto the Lord, you know. I don't want, in fact, I've, I've just about been, I used to write some songs, and I know my daughter writes some songs, and I've just been tempted here lately to just start writing some good old doctrinal songs, right? Some good uh, independent fundamental Baptist doctrine in the songs, and, and, uh, and, and I, I think it's needed. I'm not against something that's new. You know, we don't have to sing all the old songs from the 1800s and 1900s. I love them, and if they're good and, they're, and there's nothing wrong with them, why not keep singing them? Uh, how about the songs that just go quote the Bible, just straight from the Bible? 
straight from the Psalms or straight from uh, somewhere else in the Bible, and, and we just quote those. Those are great. Those are great. But uh, a lot of this new stuff, it's just like there's really no reason for it. It's not really accomplishing any. Who's being celebrated? Who's getting, you know, who's getting the benefit of, these, of this singing? A lot of times it's uh, unfortunately not really God. Even though the song might say God in it, oftentimes he's not really getting the glory. All right, we got to get through this. There's some reading we got to do here. Okay, even if a song, is that where we are? Even if a song talks about the songwriter or someone else, the context should always focus all the glory to God and not man. You say, what were you talking about? Well, let's say you write a song and it's not just about all directed straight to God. For instance, that's what Moses did and Miriam did. They're talking about an event that happened. They're talking about specific people. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18. We'll give you another example. Oh, I'm sorry. Go to Judges 5. I jumped the gun here. <clears throat> and so even whenever the song is actually about an individual Throughout the Bible, we have a lot of good examples of this where God still gets all the glory. Judges 5, uh, this is the song that was sung by Deborah and Barak, the, uh, the song of uh, Abinoam on the day, saying, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. Right? They, they willingly offered himself, therefore he was able to deliver Israel. So he's, he's, giving, he's pointing that out. Uh, in the song right away, you go down. I mean, uh, this is most women's for some reason, for some demented, twisted reason. Some women's favorite story is JL. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I don't understand why it's so so cool. But anyway, and so look at uh, verse uh, 26. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer, she smote Sisera. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. And they're pointing out this story of an event that actually happened. And they're glorifying the story. And it even kind of sounds a little bit like they're glorifying uh, Jael. But it begins, uh, but then they keep on going. And verse 31, so let all thine enemies perish, O Lord. But let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. And the land had rest 40 years. So you see this great song that was talking about an event. It was talking about something that happened and, and actual people that did this, uh, th did this event. And then, uh, but the, all the glory goes to God. Another great example, look at Luke chapter 1. I love this kind of song of Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse 46. Not quite sure how someone, uh, somebody who's Catholic could read this and, uh, and not see what Mary's saying here, but oh, I said Matthew, didn't I? It's Luke. So you're familiar with Luke 1. The angel uh, tells Mary she's with child. And look at verse 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in, the, in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear, uh, fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted the, them of low degree. And she's, she's really humbly saying, this is an amazing thing that God has allowed me to do. And even though she's talking about her own self in the song, all the praise is going to God. And she's magnifying him and she's lifting up his name. Okay, so, so music can be used, and we see a lot of examples of this in the Bible, it can be used to glorify God. But music can also be used, number two there, to proclaim what man has done, where God's not getting the glory is what I'm getting at. Is just, it is just uh, the man that receives the glory. Now look at 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 18. 
<clears throat> so music used to proclaim what man has done. And look at verse 6. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine. Now he had just killed Goliath. It was a great victory, a great day for the people of, of the Lord, and, uh, and the enemy was defeated. It came to pass that the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another, and they played, and they said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands. You see how it's all about David? Even Saul, really, but they're ascribing more people to David than they did Saul. What's that cause? That causes jealousy in Saul probably causes some pride in David, although at that time he didn't seem to struggle with pride, but later on he is lifted up by all the attention that he's getting and everything. But you see there, uh, uh, these ladies are singing. It's not necessarily David's fault, right? But these ladies are singing. They're saying, oh, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is ten thousands, and they're singing this song praising David. Now, let me make a little application here. Another example would be songs that promote I'm going to talk about just so we can apply to ourselves right now. Songs that promote a team or a place or a group of people. And I'll give you a couple examples. All right. I am not a huge sports team fan, so I don't even know what a lot of the, like, uh, you know, the, the fight songs and all that stuff are. But I lived in uh, Oklahoma for a while. And I'm telling you, almost everybody I knew was a Boomer Sooner fan. Oh, you. Okay, and so there was this everybody's boomer sooner, boomer sooner. I don't even know what that means. Okay, <laughs> and their fight song, boomer sooner, boomer sooner. So you know if they're just really on game day and they're just pumping up their team, and maybe some OSU fan comes by, they'd all be like boomer sooner, boomer sooner. It's their fight song. It's a song of their team, and they're glorifying their team, and and they're saying that. And you know sometimes it doesn't even have any words. Oh, 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 everybody knows what, I think there's several teams that use that, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> anyway, right, and they're just puffed, I mean, I'm not, it's just a stupid game, but they're puffed up, oh, my team, my team, and their team spirit, and they're, and they're singing the song, and uh, it's giving uh, uh, this uh, glory to some, a, a place, uh, here's another thing, uh, there was a, well, we went to we went to this camp, okay, a church camp. It was just it was just fun. They weren't necessarily trying to be non spiritual, but anyway, there was a, in the cafeteria when everybody was eating, they would take turns singing songs. That's a long story. I won't get into it. But uh, all the people from Texas, it's like every song they wanted to sing is the star is bright. A bit, how's it go? The star at night is big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas. I mean, just all about their state. They're just, how many of you ever been to Texas? How many of you, they like their state in Texas, okay? They're proud, of, they're proud of themselves. And so they're just always wanting to sing about their state, all right? And so uh, we see that. Uh, how about this? National anthems, right? All these things, they typically glorify man, and they cause pride or jealousy, and really, jealousy is pride, isn't it? Right? It's kind of on the other side. So you got one person that's being sung about. They're lifted up with pride. The person that's jealous, right, is their pride that they're not the ones being sung about or whatever. And, uh, and this is what we see. Some of these types of songs may have their place in secular settings and are harmless. I don't care if somebody loves Texas, loves being a Texan, and they want to sing about Texas. I don't... It's okay, right? It's not like the end of the world. I don't think it's necessarily, and that was vanity. I mean, you're not going to get rewards in heaven for being a Texan, I don't think. <laughs> Some might disagree, but, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, you know, overall, that's just a secular thing that's of no, uh, really of no value, okay? And in fact, could probably lead someone to get in the flesh, be prideful or whatever by using music to glorify or to praise something, okay? I, I don't see anything wrong with folk songs that kind of have historical value. I was just thinking about this uh, this afternoon about a, 
uh, uh, John Henry was a mighty man. <laughs> You ever heard that song? I don't even know where. I don't know. The, the history goes way back, all right, about some a guy. Uh, uh, I'm guessing he was a slave, and his job was just to work on the railroad and drive the stakes in there. And, the, and then some, uh, somebody came, had built a steam machine that would do that, you know, uh, with, through the machine, right? And so he had some kind of race to beat the machine, and he beat the machine. He was able to drive him in faster than the machine. It's a silly song, right? It's just a folk song. It's not necessarily, not everything secular is bad, you know. I mean, again, we learn our ABCs through a song. It was music, right? When we read a book, we read, you know, Dr. Seuss or something to our kids. It's not necessarily wrong. There's probably some bad stuff in there if you're not careful, you know. Uh, we read some stuff to our kids. I remember reading the uh, Rainbow Fish. I was like, hey, this looks like a cute story. It's about sharing, and it's about, I got to the end, I'm like, that's total socialism that's being taught in that book, right? So even at kids, like, you got to be careful what secular stuff they hear, whether they're watching something on TV or reading a book or watching something on the Internet. You say, oh, well, we don't watch TV. Yeah, well, the Internet's just full of garbage, okay? Just, it's just not really any different than watching TV. So, so there's a lot of uh, dangers out there that we got to be careful of. And by the way, come to, uh, speaking of that, a lot of times we think, oh, well, music has such an influence on kids, so, you know, we don't want them to hear the world's music. Uh, well, guess what? They're going to hear it everywhere they go. And if they watch uh, something on TV, probably going to have music in the background because music is everywhere. And it's often used as a celebration or a mood enhancer, but I can't get ahead of myself yet. Okay, so. Uh, but. Some of these types of songs have their place. You know, okay, I was also going to mention patriotism not against people having a national anthem. Uh, but here's the next point. The worst example of this to me would be when these things are used to worship someone or something over God. Now, you guys already know Daniel 3, but we're going to go there anyway. Daniel 3. Music is used... There's no getting around that in this uh, chapter here. Ezekiel, Daniel, look at chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to, get, to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains and judges and treasurers, counselors and sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together into the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried out, to you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time... When all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, sorry. All the music, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden idol. I mean, golden image, <clears throat> which is an idol. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of the fiery, uh, burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy God, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, sultry, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, my favorite line, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that uh, we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Okay, so anyway, I had just had to read all that because I love that story. But isn't it true uh, how music can be used? And it's like, man, you've got to submit to that. And uh, unfortunately, even, uh, and look, my dad was in the Marines 20 years I grew up on a military base, and, uh, and, and you know, I've, 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 I've grown up with patriotism and, and uh, you know, thank the, thank the Lord for all the men that died and sacrificed and all that stuff, and I, and, I, and I understand that. But I remember growing up also on the military base, uh, it was required. You get in big trouble if you didn't do this, right? Maybe you didn't know this about military bases, but... Uh, at certain time, maybe it was noon or maybe it was several times a day. I actually can't remember this, but the national anthem would sound. Dun, 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 dun. And if we were out in the playground playing or whatever, we had to stop what we were doing. If there was a flag nearby, we had to salute the flag. And if not, we would just kind of aim towards wherever the music was coming from or whatever. And we had to put our hands over our heart. Of course, military people had to salute or whatever until the, until the national anthem was done. And then we can go back to playing whatever we were playing. And I remember reading the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and saying, man, that must be what it felt like. <laughs> you know, it's just like, as soon as you hear the music, everybody just like, of course, they bow down and everything. But, uh, uh, but I remember feeling like, that's just odd. You know, and then I grew up, Baptist churches my whole life. Like, I don't think that they're being irreverent and trying to worship a false uh, god or worship the nation. But it's really, it's really kind of creepy to me, right? When they pull out the flag and, and they're like, hey, everybody stand up. And, and we're not going to even talk about God right now. We're just going to salute this flag and praise God that we're Americans and all that stuff. And, and just really not even stop and think about what they're saying, you know. And we won't get into that. But anyway, you, you understand. I think oh, most of us uh, no, no doubt on the same page on that. But here, here's the conclusion of this uh, lesson. As Christians, we should be celebrating our Lord at every chance we get. You know, there's a lot of things to celebrate. Not necessarily wrong. It's not wrong to celebrate somebody's birthday or celebrate some. But every chance we get, we should be celebrating the Lord. Okay. And music is a great way to do that. But unfortunately, many of us, many Christians in general, uh, spend most of their time celebrating themselves. Right? We celebrate ourselves. Or we celebrate one another. Or we celebrate our favorite team. Or we celebrate our nation. Or all this. Over celebrating God. Like, like though we're more prone to, to have times where our music will celebrate these things than actually celebrating the Lord. Even at Christmas time. Now look, it's unfortunate that some of the Christmas songs aren't sung all year round because <laughs> the Christmas songs are some good songs. Yeah, it's good doctrinal songs. And, uh, and I love singing those songs at Christmas time. But oftentimes people say, oh, it's so close to Christmas. Yeah, we can start listening to Christmas music. And it's like jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle all the way or, or rocking around the Christmas tree or all these things. And I'm thinking... Well, this is why you ask kids. I, I have worked in children's ministry for many, many years. You ask kids today, hey, what's Christmas about? They have no clue. They won't tell you Jesus. Hardly any of them will tell you unless they grew up in church. Uh, they won't tell you this is the day that Jesus, you know, we celebrate Jesus being born. Or, or no, they just think it's about the presents. You know, they think it's about Santa Claus. They think it's about all these, these things because that's what they celebrate. That's what the songs that are played. They go to public school. They can't hear songs about God in public school. So they're hearing songs about uh, secular events, about people, about all these things. And so that they grow up 
and they, don't, they spend very little time celebrating God in music. Okay? Now you say, well, what about church? Okay? The average Christian, probably the only time they sing songs that celebrate the Lord are at church. And unfortunately, that's even going away. That's even going away. Uh, I would say the average Christian tends only to celebrate the Lord in music when they're in a church service. Even then, it seems God rarely gets proper attention in the music. Besides the fact that much of today's church music, quote unquote, is, a, is more entertaining than edifying, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I mean, praise the Lord, I've been mostly independent fundamental church. Uh, I've been all independent fundamental churches my whole life. Uh, so I've had very little exposure to, and I'm talking the independent fundamental. So these, you know, it's not like uh, more progress, I mean, uh, uh, contemporary type, you know. So praise the Lord, I've been exposed to very little of that. But just to find out what's out there, I'll, I'll look online, look at services, live stream services, or I'll look at hey, what are the most popular songs sung in churches today or whatever. And I look at what's out there and I say this, those aren't really about God. They're not really celebrating God. They're celebrating themselves. All the songs out there about feel good, about celebrating themselves. And I'm going to show you that here in a minute. But more of it's just entertaining than edifying. And the message of many modern songs has been tailored to celebrate self. And what's the Bible say? Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. This is what music should do. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I don't see just a bunch of charismatic, feely, feel good... That's just, you know, whatever makes you move and wave your hands and all that kind of stuff in that verse. I see, uh, you know, the word of Christ dwelleth in you richly in all wisdom. And I see teaching and I see admonishing and psalms and spiritual songs. Singing in grace in your heart to the Lord. I mean, all these are very specific and very purposeful. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's lacking in a lot of churches. And so I looked up, like I said, because I don't go to those churches, I Googled. <laughs> what are the most popular songs in churches today? Okay, and, uh, and I can verify, unfortunately, even some independent Baptist churches, they're still conservative, right? But they're allowing some of these songs really to come in, and they're singing them maybe in a more traditional, you know, kind of maybe only piano, maybe they don't have drums up there, whatever, uh, kind of like the, you know, uh, I'm not really trying to pick on anybody, but kind of like the West Coast mentality. It's coming out, it's just slowly getting watered down, slowly becoming just like what we see in the, the uh, mainstream uh, Christian music. So here are some of the songs that have made it into uh, regular church services, okay? And the first one that came up was Who, let's see, Who You Say I Am by Hillsong. I didn't know they really sing Hillsong in church. I thought that was just like for entertainment purposes, but apparently they sing them in, song, in, in church. But here's what happens. Actually, they don't because they get worship leaders up there that will play the music and they'll entertain the people. And a lot of times they're not singing. They might sing like a little line out of the song, but usually they're just there like at a rock concert being entertained by the people on the stage. Okay, and so, uh, so that's probably why uh, this goes on. But here's where the songs of the... Uh, here's the lyrics to the song. It says, uh, Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Always oh, love for me, always oh, love for me. Okay? Uh, that doesn't sound bad, okay? And most of it's not, it doesn't just inherently evil whenever you start reading the words. It's just, it seems like there's just not a lot of meat there. And then if you really focus on it, again, all the attention's on self. You know, who am I? Right? I was lost, but he brought me in. It says, who the son says free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last. He has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Sounds like a Joel Osteen message. The second one that came up was this. I don't even know this, who this is, but by House Fires. 
and it was called Build My Life. Actually, I think this was the first one that popped up, but it didn't get in that way. Holy, there is not, there was no one like you. All right, that's good. He's emphasizing the Lord, right? There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life on your love. It is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken. You say, oh yeah, that's about the Lord, right? I saw a lot of eyes in there. <laughs> I will do this and I'll be that and I'll be, I'll live my life for you, Lord, and I'll do this. The next one was by Hillsong again. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. Amen. No other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this, uh, what a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great. Your love was greater. What could separate us now? You say... Well, I sell, uh, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, that was it. The next, okay, so we're going to the next song. Okay, so, uh, so then I, I just looked, okay, well, those are, those are church songs, which is interesting. It seems to me like maybe there's not much difference between what's being sung in church and what people listen to on the radio, but I got to thinking, okay, what's the big station out there that everyone listens to, the contemporary type music? Caleb, exactly what I thought about, positive, encouraging, right, Caleb, all the same songs that are being sung in church, really. And, you know, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, you know, what you know, you know, there's just so much negativity out there. What we really need in church is just positive and loving and encouraging. And I'm like, you just described, you know, 99% of the churches out there. And you're saying we need more of that. <laughs> right? And so uh, it's interesting. But anyway, so that's what all the songs. No, it's got to be positive. It's got to be encouraging. And so I looked up, well, so what are like on Caleb's like top hits? The billboard, you know, the, the, the charts. Uh, here's what it says. Number one, I already mentioned her, but she's not only in the top charts in Kayla, but top charts in secular music, right? And she says uh, it's Lauren Daigle. And the song is, You Say, I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and, and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Ooh, oh, <laughs> you say I'm loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I think I'm weak. You say I'm uh, held when I'm falling short. And when I don't belong, oh, you say I'm yours. Rescue by Lauren Daigle. You are not hidden. There's never been a moment you were forgotten. You are not hopeless. Though you have been broken, your innocence stolen. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the dark, darkest night. It's true. I will rescue you. Who's that about? Is that about God? No. <laughs> it's about self. It's about you. I want you to feel good. I want you to be encouraged. And I want you to, be, uh, to, to just have that feel good. All right. Casting Crowns has a song named Nobody. Again, I don't know any of these. Maybe you guys uh, are familiar with them. And I'm, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to hide anything. I mean, when I was a teenager, actually before I met Valerie, like uh, I thought, hey, contemporary music, that's great. I remember as a, as a earlier teenager, I guess, but when I mentioned DC Talk Girl, I remember when they came out, I literally said to my friend who I was trying to encourage in the Lord, right? I was trying to win them and everything, and I was like, this is great, man. That sounds just like the world music. I didn't know any better, right? I thought, this is great. Like, the world will actually listen to this, and that's not really the way it works, all right? They got to accept the God, uh, the God of the Bible. They got to accept the message of the Bible, right? And, 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 and then they'll, the actual Christian music will make a difference in the heart. But you're trying to take the message of God and package it where it's pretty and the world just loves it. You're, you're just, you're fighting an endless battle. It's not going to, it's not going to happen, right? That's not what they want to hear. So you have to tailor it to, okay, what do you want to hear? And all these guys, uh, uh, Lauren Daigle, Toby Mac, or whatever, you listen to their interviews and they literally say, well, I don't really consider myself a Christian artist. Like I am a Christian. I just make music and write whoever wants to listen to it. Why do they have to say that? Because they want to sell money. Right. I mean, they want to sell albums and make money. Love of money is the root of all evil. And, and really, if you think about well, how Satan's using that, right, watering down this so-called Christian music so that they can sell albums, and then they're taking that 
and they're putting it in the church and they're singing that as the Christian music that's been watered down and they're leaving out the most important part about music, actually celebrating and honoring the Lord. They mention the Lord, but really they're celebrating and honoring themselves, right? And it's really, really dangerous and we don't want to ever get uh, to where we're playing that game. And don't think it doesn't happen with independent Baptist uh, singers and groups, you know? Uh, shall I talk about the Gaithers? <laughs> right? Oh, the Gaithers, what are you talking about? God, the Southern Gospel, that's some good stuff. They took the focus off God in a lot of those songs and put the focus on self. They put the focus off of, hey, we're celebrating God, and they're saying, let's just be entertained and have fun and be emotional and uh, very much affected by the whole charismatic uh, philosophies. Well, really, there's some more, but I don't even want to read them. So, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, look, I'm not saying that we have to just go out and every time there's a song we don't agree with 100% or, we, or we, somebody leads a song from the songbook and you're like, man, that's just, a, that's just a shallow. I'm not saying every time just bash them and say that they're wicked for doing that or whatever. But we got to think. It's interesting. Okay, I, I, I believe this. I'm right on this. I've, I've heard another guy say that. I, I, don't know, I don't know if this is exactly right. But the word music, right, where does it come from the word muse? What does it mean to mute, to muse, right? To think, to think on something. Music should cause you to think, right? That's what Colossians 3 says. That's what Ephesians 5 says. Uh, we're making melody in our hearts to the Lord, right? And in Colossians, it's talking about uh, admonishing one, other, one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, right? And so, you're, so there's this, uh, uh, this idea of thinking through what you're singing, and it's affecting you. It's helping you to grow, right? But everybody wants to just kind of get rid of that part, and they want to be amused, right? Not mused, not music. They want amusic, I guess. <laughs> they want entertainment. They don't want to think. They want to just be able to just go with the music. And really, let's be honest. You go to a church service where they're saying a lot of contemporary stuff. You say, what was that song just about that you sang? I have no idea. And again, some of our independent Baptist songs are the same way. You know, there's, there's a, uh, I don't want to go start going down the list, but there are songs that uh, are sung regularly in like the, the camp meeting type, type churches. And you listen to it and you're like, man, there were some good lines right there. But nobody said amen. And then you get to this part uh, of the song that's really shallow. And everybody, amen, and they're shouting. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why did they shout right there? Well, I'll tell you why they shouted right there. There was a key change. There was a change in the feel of the music. It was all about emotions. It didn't have anything to do with the message of the song. And so we've got to be very careful when we're choosing our music, when we're using the music to celebrate God, when we're incorporating that into our, our worship of God, that we pick uh, songs that are edifying, okay? Songs that truly do, number one, glorify God, celebrate Him. Number two, uh, admonish others, right, and, and teach them about God or teach them something that's going to help strengthen them, or it's simply making melody in our heart unto the Lord, right, going around singing this song in your heart unto the Lord all day long. It might not be edifying anybody, although it is edifying you, there's no doubt about that, but it's edifying to the Lord. He's pleased in that, right? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for music. Thank you for, uh, for giving that uh, us that that uh, I guess something probably that that no none other of your cre creatures can comprehend. Lord, help. Uh, thank you for helping us to have intellectual minds that understand to some degree uh, mu notes and and sounds and put it all together in a way uh, that can be used as another tool to celebrate you and to worship you and to edify one another. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to use it as uh, tool for that purpose and not just to edify ourselves and entertain ourselves, Lord, but I pray you be glorified with what we do as a church and then what we do individually in our own lives when it comes to uh, the music that we choose, the music that we listen to, Lord. Uh, bless your church now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's all stand. And I don't think I picked a song. <laughs>